evening. This is the Fort River School Building Committee on Wednesday, January 23rd, uh, 2019. Um, we're at the police station uh, community room, and this uh, meeting is being uh, taped for broadcast by Amherst Media. Um, and I will call us to order. Uh, first item on our agenda is uh, preving, uh, approving minutes from the previous meeting. Um, and so I'll first open it up to whether people have comments, questions, uh, corrections to the last set of meeting minutes, which Rudy graciously did for us. Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to accept them. Motion to approve uh, the minutes of the last meeting. Second. All in favor? Abstention. I think we got enough positives. Um, <laughs> which will bring me to the, to the next question of uh, who, who would be willing to uh, record this evening. We went around and played a game of not it. We <laughs> 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 started here and uh, there are three people presently here who have not recorded before. Uh, I still have a set of minutes that I need to complete, so if you're not. tells me I might be on that list. I'm definitely on that list. I am it. Would you guys like to do Draw straws. They don't have to be super detailed. We, we don't have to record every word. We have most 99% of the time we have the recordings, well, which, which we should note that we don't have from last time because yeah. there was a, a snafu. So I would say if, if you're willing to do it, that would be great, but I would suggest that we all take some notes just yes. in case because they were lo the, the tape was wiped. Last time, so you may not. Um, there, it back. may not be there, so you should take minutes. Like, it's you not going to be there. Those. We will help you have that. Good. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, I do it, I do it all the time. It works. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I still have my list. I think it's like the the, the twelve ten or something like that. Yeah. It was our two and a half hour one, and I've gotten through about an hour, and I just haven't finished. Yeah, I think we only have one more meeting before we have to. Yeah. Um, so we can move on, I think, from uh, meeting, meeting, uh, <laughs> minutes, uh, both approving and taking, uh, moving to public comment. I know Mr. Rilk has some comments, so I will let him make his comments. You want to read the Pardon? Oh, yes. I, I, what I'm going to say is written down on a piece of paper, which yes. I put in front of you, John. So I was yes, to I will, I will hand some either, way, either direction here. <coughs> this way, coming up. That's the uh, 111. This is the 111. I think yeah. this is the other one. Okay. And then, oh, and there's this one here. Yes. That's last week's. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we have lots of paper tonight. Yeah. yeah. So we are not being very sustainable. No. Yeah. Unfortunately, paper is somehow something we managed to not do without you. Uh, do you want to get started? Yes. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Um, I have sent my January, January 11 notes, which I believe you have on my opinion that deciding to reuse the existing boiler for building renovation is equivalent to deciding to perpetuate the use of fossil fuels. I'll be happy to explain those notes in further detail if you wish. Basically, boilers burn fossil fuels to heat water. This hot water is distributed in pipes and coils throughout the building to heat the building. Heat pumps are much more efficient and use electricity, not fossil fuels, but they don't use water for distribution, they use refrigerant. Once you put in water-based distribution, you will, be in pra you will in practice always use fossil fuel boiler boilers to heat the water. You'll never decide to replace all that distribution piping and coils, you'll just replace the boiler. But the bottom line for me is that in this time, at this time in history, we shouldn't be making long-term investments in fossil fuel infrastructure. Reusing the boiler for me carries with it a high likelihood that we would be doing just that. This is just a feasibility study. We don't have to decide now on the details of an HVAC system that won't be designed for years. It may not ever be designed if Dr. Morris's uh, proposal to the school committee this week is any guide. All we have to do is carry a reasonable dollar allowance for a responsible HVAC system which the architects have done. At this early stage, at this level of accuracy, there is no significant dollar difference between most of the likely HVAC options. So I asked respectfully 
that the committee include in its final report a statement something like this. With our architects, we have investigated on a feasibility basis several alternate HVAC systems, some for new construction and some potentially different for renovation. Amherst ZE, by Amherst ZE bylaw requires that new construction have HVAC that uses no fossil fuels. However, it doesn't limit the HVAC choice for renovation projects. Nevertheless, considering the gravity of the climate crisis and Massachusetts' stated goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050, uh, I recommend strongly that any proposed renovated school buildings also be designed with HVAC that avoids any use of fossil fuel energy. I shouldn't have said I, I should have said we. We recommend strongly that any proposed renovation, renovated school buildings also be designed with HVAC that avoids any use of fossil fuel energy. Secondly, I've commented before on the size of the ground-mounted PV arrays that are included on the site plans we have seen. I find the sizes surprising in part because all of the four net zero institutional buildings that now exist in Amherst have no ground mounted PV. I would suggest, one, using a higher rated PV panel, commercial 370 watt panels will be available soon from Super Sun Power, two, using a building design that employs south facing sloped roofs. This will eliminate the need for PV racks and the spacing between the racks. Three, using HVAC to C systems that do not employ rooftop equipment because the rooftop equipment <coughs> takes up space on the roof or that uh, could otherwise have PV on it. And four, targeting a slightly more ambitious, ambitious EUI. I suggest 25 instead of 30. Thirdly, at the risk of repetition based on decades of experience, I do not agree that renovation of this poorly insulated, non-accessible, aging, code compliant, code non-compliant, and impossibly configured building with infrastructure in need of full replacement will cost less per square foot than new construction. Thank you. Now we move on to uh you think Jesse? Sure. Um, I, I brought a presentation which I've handed out and we'll, we'll hit on costs. I'm not sure we'll get every item on the agenda. We may need to come back at the next meeting. Some of those my, my, my hope, and we, don't, and we may not get to here, is that we're getting close to the end of, of, of our review of costs. Um, we are projecting, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, uh, some sort of public outreach event on the 13th. 13th, thank you. Um, and so I'm hoping we're nearing enough conclusion on it that we're all comfortable kind of going public, you know, being in public and talking about numbers, um, knowing that we can <coughs> undoubtedly make some revisions, you know, until the day we issue the report. Sure. Um, but that's kind of my preface to the group, even though we're a few a body short this evening. So. Okay. Yeah. Take you through. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll talk about the estimates first. Um, and then talk about this observation matrix, our homework from last time, if you remember. Um, I included this slide again. Um, we've had some emails with members of the committee um, discussing um, whether the direct cost in the estimates is, is in line with, um, with benchmarks, basically, if it makes sense. Um, is it credible, and does it make sense for, for this project? And, and I know we previously discussed this. I just wanted to come back to it. Perhaps when you think about community outreach, um, this will reappear to answer some of those questions. Um, in that we've looked at Fort River um, and we've leveled its estimates cost um, to the Wildwood School project that was estimated previously in Amherst. Is it just the same way you can make it bigger? Or do we have people yeah. here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's it's here. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, it's nice and large. Okay, okay. yeah. Our TV viewers will be standing All right, I've got my computer in front of me, so I wasn't looking at the paper. Okay, thanks. Um, to the Wildwood Elementary School, and then also to the Maple Elementary School. It's um, planned for construction um, nearby. I believe that's is that East Hampton. East Hampton or North Hampton. It's North Hampton. East. East, thank you. Can I ask a quick question? Why 
Maple Elementary School because it seems that it's a very big project and high construction cost. So it's not it doesn't it doesn't fall on the benchmark of the average of the MSP of the projects. It was a local project um, okay. for one. Uh, it is larger. That's true. That probably lowers its cost per square foot. But still, sure. the cost is much higher, and it's higher than the average for the MSBA. Right. Maybe higher than the average, but um, being similar, and then it's a, a, a local area of building is why we picked it. We don't want to compare to Boston, or we don't want to compare to a you know a cheaper market. Let's say that's our thinking. Uh, but it's a good question. Um, so we made this comparison, um, and you can see that if you look at the cost per square foot as reported at the MSBA, the Maple is 500 is, is much lower than ours at 601, and um, they're both higher than the Wildwood was at 440. Um, however, it's important to adjust for time escalation, um, adjust for the PV array that the other projects do not include. Uh, and adjust for um, the delivery method that's, um, that's in that blue box that says cost leveraging. So um, we're, as a CM method, whereas Maple was um, a direct um, GC type project delivery. So when we do that, our project cost ends up within the, the two benchmarks we're looking at. Um, and it, I think it helps to compare apples to apples in that way. I mean, when we think about PV panel costs in the projects, and, and as we're reporting it um, across the entire 147 options, we've always included the cost of the panels as if you plan on buying them. Right. And I think that's just generally inflating all the costs when you look at other benchmarks, because many towns will lease the panels at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, something to consider as we're projecting these numbers out. That's what we want to do. Are there any other questions about this? So the PV is direct cost, it's before contingencies, so this, this is This is um, not the direct cost, this would be inflated to include the contingencies. Direct cost was the last side. Okay, so this was includes contingencies. You mean the 49, 15, 14 at the bottom? No, the, 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 for the PV it includes the contingencies. So right, then so at the I bottom. The direct was more like 3 million, like not the 40. Is it up top? It is 3.396. 3. Oh, there, yes. Yes. Sorry. Good evening. <laughs> Any other questions here? I mean, I guess I. Oh, sorry, I should do it. Go ahead. I do share um, Elena's uh, concern about you know it, it being you know a school rather than looking at others, and it is it is one of the the larger size projects um, and. Higher, you know, cost per square foot. So, so I would, in in terms of taking this and showing it to other folks, I would recommend against having just like picking a school and saying, oh, we're we're in that ballpark. Um, are you going to be talking more about the other things uh, about the markups? markups and That's the next slide. Okay. So, so I want to um, hit direct cost first. Right. So, um, you know, when when I was. When I looked through at the different options that that we have, are our, our options, and I was using HVAC four, five, six, and the the, the choices A through E. Um, looking at the direct costs, I think those are more in line, and if, if so, I think there might be a better way to kind of express this. Um, but. Um, if. Which, which, by the way, which option is this? Is this A, four, five, or six? That's on. Here? This is A, it just A blank. A, oh, it would be A six. I understand. Okay. Yep. Um, and this is bid or constru or um, construction. Yes, CM. Okay. So I mean, I think I mean, the trouble is right. Like all of those things play a role in, um, you know, which which HVAC system you pick which of the options, you know, the new or the renovation, and whether you do CM or bid. Um, and which phase things are at in, in their planning process. Well, that's, process. that's yeah. markup. But, but even all, just all of those three decisions, um, 
give you vastly different direct costs. So for example, I mean, if you go down to, let's just even go the difference between like B6, the direct cost when I was looking at this, it's more in the mid 300s, whereas A6 is 413. So it's those differences of 20, 30, 40, $50 dollars per square foot makes a huge difference when you multiply by 85,000 square feet. Sure. So, um, but within our matrix, you're right, if you were to average out all of the options in our matrix, leave F out because that's not really right. comparable. You're going to be at a much lower number than this 600 here at like 370 or something. Which I think that compares very well to a. Oh no, that's not no. The, the direct. That's the direct cost per square foot. That's not because these are construction costs per square foot. So it's not. It's that's not, true. But yeah, I, yeah. I, compared to the 418 of option A, but um, you'd be less. Yeah. I wouldn't. Sorry. I wouldn't average between all our options because. If you want to compare to another school, there has to be a new school. And yeah. A is a completely new, so right. the cost of construction, renovation, I think if we want to be clear about the cost, I think if you go, it has to be all new compared to all new. No, I agree. I, I think um, yeah. the idea of averaging is, is not great for this. I, I, I prefer to pick uh, specific options and the comparisons. Yeah. Um, but. I, I know that we're thinking about averaging, so. Thinking about averaging what? Uh, that, that we're thinking about comparing our direct costs to uh, an average of MSPA published direct okay. costs, which are out there. For new construction. And for I apples to apples, for like new construction. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that's a great approach. I, well, I, I, th I think I'd like to try to step back half a step and figure out what, what our goal is and how we want to present the numbers to um, the, the general public, uh, because we have to demonstrate certain credibility, um, even though we're not we're never going to be exactly done because we're never actually going to produce a building as part of this, and so the numbers will never quite get that refinement. And so, I don't know if it helps to get a little further into the pres presentation tonight, okay. and okay. then okay, try, and then have that mm -hmm. conversation. But Eric. yeah, I but. Um, Sure, but I, let me just. Uh, I'm not. I'm not really sure what we're trying to accomplish by. Um, figuring out what's a comparable and what's the right point in time for the comparable and all this kind of stuff. I mean, part of me thinks that if you build in um, extra uncertainty into the budget because you're talking about a building that, in this theoretical concept, is going to be built in two years' time or something or three years' time. You know, an alternative approach would be to present two numbers. One number is saying, since this is just hypothetical, it's a feasibility study. True. One way you could say is, deliver me a price tag with all the still vagueness of the fact that it's not a, a final design. Um, for now, like remove those other uncertainties and say, only put in the, the contingency you'd normally put in, put in the wiggle you'd normally put in because you're not a final design, uh, strip away the inflation adjustment, and say, if we were building this building right now uh, and going to final design the next stage after the end of the feasibility, here's the price tag. Since, by the way, we're not doing any of those things and it's possible this will be three years from now, here's what this looks up sort of marked up for the uncertainty and for inflation adjustment and just have both of those numbers. One of them is going to be lower than the other. And But it, at least, it, it mean, it, I don't know. Anyways, so. Well, it's a good segue to the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. You want to try. Um, so the next slide deals with those markups that are in our estimate. Um, and it's, it's something we've talked about before with you, um, that um, you have a direct cost, which is sort of your estimate for the materials and elements that are in the project. And then you, you have some contingencies, which reflect um, the fact that the documents in this case are very sketchy. We're at the very beginning. It's a feasibility study. So we're, we're holding some money for developments as we develop the design and, and reflecting the fact that the estimate can't be that precise at this point. And so that money is there as um, a design contingency of 12%. Um, and along with CM at risk comes a construction contingency, uh, which is industry standard about 2 to 3%. And we have 3% there. Um, which is part of procuring this project through CM at risk or a CM type approach. Um, 
and I've previously gone through these, I'm not going to do it all again, but I'll say that the sum total of these markups um, to get to construction costs from direct costs is currently 26%. Uh, uh, and that's not including escalation, which is the other thing that you just mentioned, Eric, uh, that we know this project wouldn't be done today. It would be done some point in the future. Um, we, we assumed bid of fall of 2020. Um, and so there's money related to the fact that money is going to continually increase in value. It'll escalate. And so um, that's also in the budget. But the, the question that was, was raised of us was, is this 20% um, markup in this part of our estimate higher than industry standard? And for what reason would it be higher? And it was a good question. And it's something I've put to our estimator. And I, I don't have a response yet. But I anticipate um, our professional estimator will, will say that this is, this is where we should be for this project. Um, but I, I'm. I, these things make sense to me when I look at each one. But when you point out that it's come out higher, I think one response to um, it being higher is that it was higher to an average of schematic design level projects. And this being feasibility study is going to have a higher amount of um, wiggle room, as Eric described it. Um, and so we have 12% for design contingency. In schematic design, we might be down to 10 or 8. So you could see 2 or 4% of this higher uh, markup just due to the fact that we're in feasibility and the MSBA projects are in schematic design. So that would explain some of it. Um, I'm not sure that's a complete enough answer, though. I'm, I'm asking you do, you, do you feel that we should adjust some of these? Um, right. So thank you for, for doing that. Um, I had looked at. Um, the MSBA data, and as you mentioned, what's available on the website is schematic design, so very different parts of the process. Um, and if you look at the average 2019 starts, that markup that you're talking about, the 20 that we have at 26, it's more on the order of 19%, maybe 20% for the others. So just to give you a, a flavor of what, what does that do to the final bottom line. So sure. you're going to take that and then you're going to compound that by saying there's going to be an escalation and you're going to take that and say, right, well, we've got soft costs on top of that. The difference in total project cost by using a 20% versus a 26% is on the order of 6 to $8 million, depending on which of which the... Which many permutations. Yeah, which yeah. of the options, you know. And again, I just looked at HVAC 4 through 6 for all of them. But, you know, that's that's what I think we have to understand and what we have to convey, that that's a big number, mm -hmm. right? So when we're trying to explain that to the, to the public, we, you know, it's just to say, like, you know, maybe we want to, maybe we don't want to bring that 26 too far down, but you should understand that the difference that it makes, you can drive, you know, a big hole through six to eight million dollars is a huge difference in final total project. With the the number that everybody will think of as what does that cost? That's the total project cost, and um, so these assumptions make a huge difference. They do. So essentially, it's one classroom size. Six million dollars, one thousand square foot. That's six hundred dollars per square foot. That gives you one extra classroom. Other people have thoughts and questions on, on, on where we're, we feel comfortable with the contingencies being. I, I thought at the last discussion, last meeting, um, you were saying that you'd be for option A, you'd be most likely to do a GC procurement. Right. So I'm wondering why we're throwing in CM contingency here and. Just a little note, escalation fall 2017, is that a typo or is that we're backing down to 2017 prices in the that benchmark? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the previous page. Oh, yeah. previous, previous page. Yeah. Um, <coughs> um, and then just for clarification, it looks like based on your P 
TV size here, this is an estimation done at an EUI of 50. We're not, th this cost estimate doesn't take us down to 30. Yeah, I appreciate these two questions, they're great. Um, so when we began the study, we threw the net out and we caught up a whole bunch of options. And they were consistent. Uh, we kept CM as the um, to project delivery method. <coughs> and we kept EUI at 50, because we knew we could get it everywhere. All the HVAC <coughs> systems could get it. Um, and I think your question gets at something I'm actually somewhat interested in, is does it make sense to report out that result, which is just sort of the raw data? Or do you think about it a little bit um, and say, well, we, we want to do EUI 30, um, and, uh, and we want to do, um, and we see a value in doing a GC approach. So why would we project out the cost to do CM approach for a new building when it can be a GC approach? And I, I think it's like making these more realistic. Um, I think that's what you want to project out at the end of the day. Um, so I've been sort of struggling with that against our, our mission to not select an option. Uh, but I, I think, I think that I don't think it means we're selecting an option. It just means that we're um, sort of refining our understanding of an option. I think it does require us to focus in. I, I don't want to do that on 147. I think we've done that exercise, but we should probably pick a few that seem to have merit and start to look at them more closely. And then I think you would have this an option that I think you're describing, which is a new building, EUI 30. Let's just put it to a mechanical system that has a number attached to it, um, and and let's let's make that recipe of option A, and then that could be our option A. I mean, I, I think if we're doing a chart comparing them all, I see the merits of keeping it all at CM for for those. But since it looks like maybe we're going to pull one out to really say this might be the representative case or the best case or the recommended case, I don't know then we should probably Or just a representative it. case for, for, for Model A. Yeah. Because in truth, that's it's hard to imagine this community not doing a GC approach for a new building and not, and given the goals that we have as a community, doing the EUI 30. Um, it, to me, that seems reasonable. Um, you know, you get, when we get into the, the renovations, it gets, it's just, there's a lot of permutations there and that, that's kind of a different issue in my mind. It, it, there's just so much variability, which I think is good in a sense, but it's also hard for both us, I suspect, and the community. To get to there. I agree with that. I, mean, I, think makes, I think it makes sense, and actually it's possible that this is feasible. I think it's good to do literally both, that if you're going to show all the options together, keep them apples to apples, but then pull out the case of A, whatever it is. Um, a realistic A. A you know, realistic A. Um, that's, that's more refined. I think that makes sense. Going back to this this question of how do we, I think to me, and maybe I'm being stupid, and if I am, fine, just tell me that. But if the concern is trying to be as, as realistic as possible with the costs um, for a project that we're sort of projecting out into the future, it seems to me that either either you have to try to be able to show and speak to the public in a way in which they understand that to the extent that additional costs are loaded into the project, it's because of uncertainties that exist both uh, because of where we are in the concept, the project concept, and also where we are in time. And so that we're sort of buying into the idea that we know that if you're sitting, if you're sitting here right now in January 2019, this is in fact probably a more expensive project on paper than it actually would come through in reality right now. But that's because of the, that the exercise essentially you're going through is saying, if I'm being asked for my best advice on the feasibility and costs of, of a, a project concept that potentially could be built in two or three years, this is the exercise as a professional I have to go through to give you that best judgment knowing that that creates a higher sticker price than that might actually be true two years from now, and certainly would be true now in all likelihood. The only other way you can go, and this is a more conceptual modeling exercise, is to strip away some of those things 
and, either, and I'm not suggesting this, I'm just literally saying, the only other way you could do it is by saying, let's pretend, for the sake of argument, that we're closer to actually going to bed. Um, what would that do to some of these assumptions? And then the other, the other question would be, um, what if we assume that we know more about the project cost than we do? That second one sounds really dangerous, meaning your design contingency sounds more dangerous because then you're literally creating sort of a, a fantasy black box in which we genuinely don't know what we don't know. And we're essentially assuming for the sake of argument that the costs are going to come in lower than they others would think they would. The first notion, though, of saying let's just pretend we're, we're going to bid in January 2019, I don't really care. I mean, if it makes it easier for people to accept the number because the number is lower because it's of a hypothetical project being done now, I don't care if we share that because, you know, because also it would make the price tag lower and that lower price tag would be, the point is, it's hard for people to conceptually say, if your first thing you're doing when they're reading a report or seeing a PowerPoint is pretend it's three years from now when you're looking at any of the numbers, who does that? No one does that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole, the whole project is theoretical. <laughs> so right. why not just pick, we have to just pick some place and, and go. I don't think, uh, yeah, and I think going, if we, if we are putting this report out in January of 2019, that's the pricing we should use. I don't, I don't see us blending it now. I don't see the benefit of it. Great, and then I'm gonna come to the side. <laughs> Sorry. I think. Oh, did you have your hand up? Or I'm, not, I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> 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 well, you had your hand up, didn't you? I, I had it up. I was first watching okay. uh, I disagree. Um, it's a feasibility study, and we should be talking about what's feasible, and a number based only on today and not planning out for when construction could feasibly start is, I think, a disservice to the community. That's all. Right. Okay, so I think what we're kind of all getting around is we want to produce something that um, that's going to be the best information upon which to make decisions or to make uh, projections. So you don't want to err too much on the underside. You don't want to say, oh, we're pretty confident that this isn't going to escalate, right? But on the other hand, you don't want to over inflate either. So, um, uh, so I think we do have to find some middle ground there. And my question is, can we find out what, for the projects that, that, that were done, that, that we have schematic design on, is there a database that we can say, like, what were you, where were you when you were at PDP or, you know, PSR, some, somewhere during the process, mm -hmm. you know, earlier stages, um, more like where we're at now, and, do, and get a sense of, hey, what happened to your markups? Did you go down? Did you go up? You know, what, or how much? Further, did you go? Is there is there, is there a way to get that information data? to that upon which we can make a reasonable guess? And I'm going to show a little bit of ignorance here, but I don't know where in the MSBA process that first estimate kind of happens. Um, it is the PDP. Okay. Yeah, that's that's accurate. And I mean, we have our experience with other PDPs and other elementary school feasibility studies that we draw on. And I would say this this feels pretty consistent. And so for you to to have it pointed out that it was higher, it was like, oh, wow. Um, so I think I think we can try to sharpen our pencil with the estimator and see if, if any of these um, have maybe been overly conservative. And so we started the process, but I don't have any feedback yet. Um, for example, GCs, you know, we've got a 24-month um, construction schedule. You could probably do this building in 22 months. Um, so even right there, you, you reduce it to a certain extent. Um, but we'd have to, I, I think, continue to speak about this um, with our estimator. I, I'm not exactly sure um, how much it would come out if it would, if it would get to where you're trying to go. But I guess you don't really want to go anywhere. If I heard you just want to know we're right, or yeah, we're yeah. in the right ballpark. Right. Right. I, right. I, I, I'm sorry. I have two comments. Um, so I so that first of all, things at the back that we were talking about realistic A. I think we have to go, if we're going to do realistic A, it should be realistic A, B, C, and D, not just only A. If, we're gonna, if you're going to choose a little bit more detail on A, I think it has to be a realistic B, a realistic C, and so on. Um, 
the other question I was having, and this is my ignorance, is 12% design contingency, that's okay. Now we are designing the feasibility, we have some cost, and there's a 12% possible escalation. But does it always go up? Or is it a fact that, because one thing, one, the other way to do is, as I said, you decide the budget, and you design for that budget. And because if this means that it always goes up, right? Or is it a matter of, like, when you have the space, you expand. You include it in the contingency service, then you let yourself go and expand to yeah. complete the budget. Because I would expect the same contingencies would be go up or down. It's not, it's, uh, if right. it's a variation, it should be up or down. I get the concept. The, the reality is the scope, um, as you design a project, does go up and down. Uh, however, the estimate is only picking up the big pieces at the beginning. And so it's as much reflecting the estimator's approach to the estimate yeah, as right. it is the actual scope going up and down. But that's what I thought it should be a debt. There should be plus or minus certain amount. They could be overestimating at the design state, at this feasibility stage. Uh, in the same way that they could be overestimated, they could be underestimated. And here we always count over underestimation. So a 10% increase means that you, right now on the feasibility we are underestimating right. and not overestimating. So the question I have is in the same way that if you have space, you occupy it. If you have contingency, you occupy it because you're already taking it home. It's embedded in your overall budget. And that's my yeah I think I think it's tied up in the way that the estimator works uh, so I don't think um, that that as you develop the project you uh, and, and if you maintain the same scope uh, it's it's not going to end up 12 percent less um, somehow it's um, it's that the estimator is not able to um, see the kind of detail there's unknowns in the drawings um, and so this this figure is identified. Um, it's his typical um, expectation of how much scope he can't see at this point, um, and it's consistent with um, their experience estimating projects. So, um, oh, I was just going to say, is there so what? Can we get this to a decision point? I, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little bit lost in well, this whole if, if, if I could, I, I think I would like to suggest is that <laughs> Jesse go back, sure. talk with the estimator, make sure that these feel like they're within industry norms, yep. and report back that they either are, in which yep. case we would move forward with them, at least that would be my recommendation. If they're not, then adjust them as, as, as needed. To be within industry. And when you say these things are within industry. And sorry, I'm really talking about the right here. to these twenty the twenty. Yeah, you know, our, is is twelve percent yeah. the right number for uh for Design feasibility study yeah. for this mm -hmm. project type. Same thing <laughs> with, with construction contingency. Um, you know, across different project types and different industries, these can vary and do vary. Um, although they feel generally right to me. Yeah. You know, they're not they're not they don't feel wildly off. We'll double check. Okay. And uh, keep in mind that we'll be talking.